Today we'll be discussing benign inflammatory and infectious diseases of the breast. First, we'll start with a case presentation. The patient is a 30-year-old female with no significant past medical history who presents with one day of breast pain and redness. She does have a history of a breast biopsy in September 2020 and the pathology was benign. She denies any history of nipple piercings, has never been pregnant, and does not breastfeed. Her social history is significant for smoking, drug abuse, and now living in a sober living facility. Her vitals were normal in the emergency room. On physical exam, she has a four centimeter area of erythema with a two centimeter area of induration and fluctuance. She has no nipple discharge, no spontaneous drainage, and no axillary lymphadenopathy. What is your differential diagnosis? Well, we should be considering mastitis, cellulitis, a breast abscess, traumatic injury or hematoma, and idiopathic granulomatous mastitis. For all the diseases we'll be discussing today, the workup is very similar. We should start with a thorough history evaluating for breast cancer risk factors, smoking status, high-risk comorbidities like diabetes and the use of steroids, trauma, and nipple piercings. On physical exam, you should evaluate for skin thickening, erythema, fluctuance, drainage, and tenderness, and evaluate the axilla for lymphadenopathy. The most useful imaging tool will be an ultrasound. However, if this patient presents to an outside facility, a mammogram may be a part of their workup. So for this patient, here's a video of her ultrasound. As you can see, she is a 2.7 centimeter hypoechoic collection with peripheral hypervascularity at the three o'clock position, one centimeter from the nipple. There's also a central echogenic focus consistent with a clip related to prior biopsy. So at this time, we diagnose our patient with a breast abscess. Breast abscesses present as an erythematous, indurated, palpable mass with possible fluctuants. A major risk factor is smoking. There are two types of breast abscesses, central and peripheral. Central abscesses are associated with periductal mastitis and the most common cause is Staph aureus followed by MRSA. The other most common pathogens are listed here. For peripheral breast abscesses, they are typically associated with an underlying disease state like diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, steroid use, and trauma. An ultrasound will show a hypoechoic well-circumscribed lesion. Here's an example of our UCH breast abscess pathway. When a patient presents to the ER with signs of infection such as cellulitis or an abscess, the ED will go ahead and order a breast abscess and upload a picture into EPIC and potentially start antibiotics. If they notice any skin breakdown, blistering, or waxy appearance on the skin, or if there's a fluid collection greater than two centimeters, then the breast surgery team will be involved. If it's during the daytime hours, they will be referred directly to the breast center for immediate management. But if it is after hours, you may get a consult through the consult pager. At this time, we have to discuss treatment of the breast abscess. You can either perform medical treatment or interventional treatment. For most small, uncomplicated breast abscesses, these can be, con can be treated conservatively with antibiotics alone, typically covering for Staph aureus like Keflex or Bactrim. For larger, persistent, or multi-loculated abscesses, you can either perform ultrasound-guided aspiration or a surgical IND. Most uncomplicated abscesses identified on ultrasound can be aspirated at the bedside with an ultrasound assisting them. If you do this, you need to refer the patient back to the breast center as an outpatient for reassessment every two to three days until the abscess resolves. However, if there's any overlying skin necrosis, the abscess is multiloculated, or the patient is toxic appearing, a surgical IND should be performed. Some surgical decision making you need to discuss are the size and placement of the incision, whether you'll be packing or placing a Penrose drain, whether antibiotics should be IV or oral postoperatively, and if the patient requires admission. Some tips and tricks for bedside ultrasound aspiration is number one, collect all the supplies you'll need. You want your local anesthetic, two 10 cc syringes, one for your local anesthetic and one for aspiration. You want a blunt tip needle, 18 gauge needle and a 24 gauge needle. You'll need your culture swabs for when you send your specimen to pathology. You'll need two chloroprep sticks and of course your bedside ultrasound and gel. Before you get started, you should ultrasound the abscess yourself to make sure you get a handle on the location and correct positioning that you and your aspiration should be performed in. 
After performing a wide local block with your local anesthetic, you should hold the ultrasound in your non-dominant hand and watch the needle tip enter the abscess cavity and aspirate, like you can see here in the image on the right. And then make sure to send your sample for culture afterwards. Next, we'll talk about some other benign inflammatory and infectious diseases of the breast. We'll start with non-lactational mastitis. One subtype is periductal mastitis and it presents as an erythematous breast. This can become a chronic disease which can lead to fistulae and chronic nipple discharge. A risk factor is smoking. Some common causes of periductal mastitis include ductectasia and squamous metaplasia, which cause duct obstruction and then mastitis. The treatment is largely supported with one <laughs> with warm or cold compresses and NSAID treatment. However, if you have chronic disease, you may require duct excision and even resection of the entire nipple areolar complex if persistent. Another subtype is idiopathic granulomatous mastitis, and this presents as an erythematous palpable breast mass. It's very rare and does not increase your risk of cancer, but it can take months to years to resolve. It's more commonly seen in the Hispanic and Arabic speaking ethnicities and can be associated with corny bacterium infections. It typically has a waxing and waning course. On imaging, you'll see an irregularly shaped mass with possible skin thickening, like you can see here on the right. On core needle biopsy, you'll see non-necrotizing granulomas. Again, this treatment is supportive, but steroids and immunosuppression may be required if severe. Surgery is non-curative. The last subtype we'll talk about is tuberculous mastitis. This presents as a solitary, tender, irregular breast mass. It may have fistulae, sinuses, axillary lymphadenopathy, and possible skin ulcerations associated with it, like you can see on this picture on the right. It's exceedingly rare, even in countries with high prevalence of pulmonary TB. On ultrasound, you can see solitary or multiple well-circumscribed masses with fistulous connections and blind ending, ending sinuses, like you can see in the right upper corner on the slide. Biopsy will show necrotizing granulomas, Langhans giant cells, culture will be AFP positive and grow mycobacterium. The treatment is that for TB. Next, we'll talk about lactational mastitis, which most commonly occurs in the first three months after giving birth. It occurs in two to 10% of breastfeeding women. The pathophysiology is typically nipple trauma resulting in poor milk drainage causing engorgement of the breast and then mastitis. If symptoms last more than 12 to 24 hours, infective lactational mastitis can develop. The most common causing pathogens are listed here. Other risk factors include history of mastitis, poor milk drainage, cracked nipples, use of antifungal cream, and breast pump use. To prevent lactational mastitis, we should be educating patients to perform frequent complete emptying of the breast and optimizing breastfeeding techniques. Treatment is supportive and we recommend frequent emptying of the breast and we need to be educating patients that they may continue to breastfeed while they have mastitis. If it becomes infected or there's no clinical improvement after 48 hours, empiric antibiotic treatment should be started against Staph aureus like Keflex or Bactrim and consider evaluating for an underlying abscess. The last disease process we'll discuss is Mondorf's disease, which is a superficial thrombophlebitis of the breast it prevents as a thick and tender palpable cord with associated erythema and swelling. The most common veins affected are the lateral thoracic, thoracoepigastric, and superior epigastric veins, and the treatment is supportive. Thank you.